This is the first part in a five-part series on Gerdel's incompleteness theorem. Before we even really get discussing what the theorem is, why it's interesting, why it's important, and all of that kind of thing, we're going to have to introduce you to what are called formal systems. Rather than defining it or anything like that, I've got an example right here. It's directly taken from Douglas Hofstadter's book, Gerdel Escherbach and it does the job quite nicely for our purposes. The name of that system is the MIU system. Systems are made out of what are called strings. See here we've got a few strings of characters. Some of them are strings in the MIU system. Some of them, as you can see, are not. The only definition to limit what is a string of the MIU system is that it contains nothing but the characters M, I, and U. SIM is not, MI3 is not, because they contain other characters. I understand that we're starting out probably a little too simple, but believe me, understanding this is going to come in very handy later. The next thing you'll notice is that some of them are called well-formed strings, some of them are not well-formed. In order to be a well-formed string, you need to start with the letter M, and then after that, the only characters you're allowed to use are U and I. So M begins every well-formed string and does not appear anywhere else. We've got some not well-formed strings here. This one doesn't start with M. This one does, but it also has an M later on, so that's no good. And this one also does not start in M. Even though all three of these contain the right characters, they are not well-formed strings. We won't be able to do anything with them. So all we are really interested in are the well-formed strings. Now, what we're going to be doing is taking well-formed strings and applying rules to them. We'll get to this axiom in just a moment. Things you're allowed to do. When a well-formed string ends in the character I, so that's a blank space, that means there's nothing that comes after it. You can take that blank space and insert a U there. So anytime something ends in I, you can make it end in IU. The next rule is that no matter what you have, as long as it's a well-formed string, it will start with the letter M and it'll contain something after it. Whatever the thing is that comes after the M, you can double it. I'll give some examples of that in a little bit if that may, might be a little bit unclear. Third rule is that wherever you have three I's in a row you can switch them out for a U. And finally when you have two U's in a row you can remove them entirely. Now there's a certain set of well-formed strings that are called theorems. A theorem is any well-formed string that begins with the axiom, uses nothing but the rules on them, and if you can get a well-formed string as a result of nothing but the axiom and the rules, then it is a theorem. Let's look at a nice little example of that. Alright, here are some theorems. There are infinitely many, but, you know, whatever. Not everything's a theorem. Some things are only well-formed strings, but not theorems. So, we start off with the axiom, which we've already been given. And let's keep the rules handy just in case. First thing we'll do is apply rule number two. Rule number two says that whatever comes after the M, you can double it. So we had MI, we have MII after using rule two. Then let's use rule two again. We had MII, we doubled the II, and there's four of them. And this is just an illustration to show that there are certainly infinitely many theorems since you can just keep doubling it as many times as you want. See we had four, now we have eight. And now that we've expanded it probably as much as we'll want to for our simple little purposes here, let's start making it smaller again. And if you look, rule three takes three characters and turns them into one, so that makes things shorter. Let's do that one. Since we have a whole bunch of I's, let's take three of them and turn them into you. Doesn't matter which ones. I chose these three right here, so we used rule three, and now we have M, I, U, then four I's. Hey, why not? Let's do the same thing again. 
we've got the M, we have that first eye that we haven't done anything with, and then we've got the U we had before, those three eyes turn into another one, and then there's one that we still haven't done anything with. And then, let's shorten it even further, we have two U's in a row, since rule 4 says we can just leave them off, we've just got the M, the first eye, and the other one that we haven't done anything with. And if you've been paying attention, you'll probably notice that we have ended up pretty close to back where we started. That happens all the time in these kinds of things. It's fine, there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways to make every theorem. And to finish this off, let's just use the only rule we haven't, which is actually rule number one. Anything that ends in an I, you can add a U to the end. So we got something that ends in an I, let's add a U. And where I think things start to get interesting is with the question, is MU a theorem? We certainly haven't proved it yet, but there are infinite different things we can do for theorems. You can try and find it out if you'd like. I'll go ahead and tell you that you're probably not going to find it, but frustratingly you might not be able to figure out a way to prove that it is not a theorem. The fact that you're not really sure whether or not trying more and more uses of the rule is going to get you any closer or not, it might just take 10,000 steps, you're, there's no way to know that for sure, or it might be impossible. And that kind of question is incredibly important to mathematicians. They certainly want to know whether or not continuing to work on a problem is guaranteed to give them results or if they might not ever get results. We're gonna be looking at one more system in this video but don't get too scared if that one was a little much for your brain to cut process all at once. You might have noticed that we called the last system a typographical system and this one is not. The difference is that now what we'll be using our nothing but numbers. Instead of rules that we're just gonna use mechanical processes on, we'll do nothing but arithmetic. So this system is gonna also use three symbols, three, one, and zero. The advantages of using these three symbols is that they're numbers, so we can operate on them as we do any other number. We'll want to know how we define well-formed strings, which they'll start with the number 3 and follow with only 1s and zeros. You're probably noticing a similarity between this one and the last system, and yes, you're right. These two systems are going to function exactly the same as each other. Our axiom will be 31 and we'll have four rules as well and you'll notice that all we're doing is substituting m's for threes, i's for ones, and u's for zeros. The rules however are gonna be a little bit more complicated since all we're doing is arithmetic on them that really limits the amount of things we can do. And a nice simple rule that we had in the MIU system where you add a u to anything that ends in an i turns out looking like that. Numbers ending in 1 can be multiplied by 10. Oh, okay, that's not so bad. However, numbers ending in 1. Searching for numbers ending in 1 is another typographical operation, so unfortunately we'll need to get a little more specific. Here we have the updated rules. They look quite a bit more complicated, but really they're pretty manageable once you get used to them. You'll see that they all start with if we have followed by a kind of long and maybe confusing string of numbers and letters, we can make and then a different uh, potentially confusing string of numbers and letters. It's not too important that we understand exactly, exactly what's going on, but the point is that you can use the same rules Instead of this sheet, we're going with this one, and instead of M's we have threes, and so on. And what you'll get is exactly the same things. We've already gone over this, and if instead of the typographical system you want to use arithmetic, here's the same exact thing. Just to get a better sense, we're going to use one example. We'll use going from the 3, 1, 1, 1, 1 to the 3 with 8 ones in, at the end of it. I know it's simpler just to remember that anything after the 3 you double, but in order to keep it purely mathematical, 
here's what you got to do. So the rules say that if we have 3 times 10 to the m plus n, we can make 10 to the m times 3 times 10 to the m plus n plus n. What, what on earth does that mean? Well, if we look at the bottom, we know that m and k are any old natural number we get to pick them, and n is a natural number, and you can use any of them as long as it's not greater than 10 to the m. Well, how on earth are we supposed to be able to tell if it fits into that form? We know that since we're using rule number 2, it's going to apply to any well-formed string, since it did on the old system, so if we're doing things right, it should do the same thing on the new one. And the trick for figuring out m and n? For n, all we do is take all of the numbers that aren't the 3 at the beginning, and for m, what we do is take how many digits it takes to get to the 3 at the beginning. In this case, m is going to be 4, n is going to be the 4 ones. First, let's make sure we're doing things right. 3 times 10m plus n. 3 times 10, what do we have for m? 10 to the 4 plus n, which is those four ones. All right, let's see. 3 times 10 to the 4 is just 3 with four zeros after it, plus 1, 1, 1, 1, and then we get 3, 1, 1, 1, 1. Is that what we started with? It sure is, so that checks out. And now what can we make? We can make 10m times 3 times 10 to the m plus n plus n. So we got 10 to the 4, and since we know that in the parentheses all it is is what we started with, we'll just substitute the 3111 in there, plus n, which we've already figured out. So 10 to the 4 times that gives us that, plus that, and there we go. Let's see if that did what we wanted it to. We were going from here to here, 3 with 4 ones to 3 with 8 ones, and that's exactly what we did. Now, why on earth did we do all that? Turns out that no matter what your typographical system is, you can do the same thing by substituting all of the characters or whatever with numbers. Any of these sets of rules, you will be able to figure out one of these sets of rules, and for any axiom you've got, you'll be able to figure out a new axiom, and that's all you need to make theorems. That might not seem very important, but trust me, in a couple videos you'll see how that actually will kind of change very much about math. So I will hope to see you soon with the next part of this video. Thank you very much for watching.